Yes, number one. What does this mean? Uh, number one is interesting because it's nice to have a successful film. It doesn't mean it's a good film. I think it is, actually. But it, uh, there seems to be very little connection between success and quality in the world of films. And it's nice occasionally when you get to experience both at the same time. Um, I'm not sure exactly what to say to you because uh, I never know what people want to know. And I live in my own little world and sometimes it relates to your world and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm hope, hopeful that uh, after I, I stop talking for the next, in the next couple of minutes that you will ask questions and then we will, we will spring off what you want to know and then I'll force down you what I want to tell you. Uh, what's useful? One thing that's useful, I, my two rules in life, here we go. We can do rules in life now. This is, uh, I was working in the Chevrolet assembly plant in Los Angeles in my junior year in college, uh, making money to get through college. And I was on the night shift, and I decided one night, this is crazy, this is a waste of human life. And I went out, and at that point decided I would never work for money in my life. And I would only do things that I had control over. And I basically stuck to that all my life, and I ended up with money and the control I wanted. I don't know how practical that is for most people, but I was lucky enough to be able to be a good cartoonist. Rather than doing my studies in college, I was busy cartooning. And, and somehow with a piece of paper and a pen, I could set out and keep control over what I wanted to do. I find, found most people when I was in school were so busy desperately trying to find the little rut in life that they were going to settle down in, and they'd set themselves goals that they hopefully could achieve within the next five years, and then they got all those things and were stuck and with nowhere to go except depression and, uh, and wondering what the whole thing was about. I've found that I've never found any answers to life. I don't know where I'm going. I just stumble one step at a time forward, but each thing I'm doing I actually enjoy, and 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 make my own mistakes along the way. And it's, it's somehow paid off. I found the world actually now rewards me for this uh, different approach to life. The most frightening thing is for all of you is you're all being pushed by parents, by teachers, by everybody, by whole society to make some choices and settle down and become a nice cog in the system. And I'd rather go out and encourage you not to do that. <laughs> It may lead to a miserable life, but it's more interesting. <laughs> the other leads to a miserable life, too, and it's less interesting. That's all I know. <laughs> all right, now I've, I've given my lecture. The truths of life have now been revealed from, by me. What do you want to know? <laughs> Is there anybody who has some questions about John Cleese's underwear color? or uh, you know? <laughs> How much do you actually remember about the fact that the son of a guy? Uh, yes, yeah, most of you probably weren't born <laughs> when we started. That's what's strange. Python never leaves me. It's like this albatross around my neck. Uh, that No matter what I do, I'm still, I'm still known as the animator from Monty Python. You can spend $45 million on a film and you're still known as the animator from Monty Python. Um, and it'll probably be on my grave, uh, gravestone. Uh, actually, speaking of gravestones... <laughs> I've decided what I'm going to put on mine. <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> no, no. No, this happened. This happened. It was, it was from a Texan in, in Dallas, Texas. I was promoting Baron Munchaus, and I was on this talk radio show. People were phoning in, and this guy called in with his thick Texan, Texan accent, and he said, Mr. Gilliam, I just love that film of yours, that Baron Munchausen. I sat there, and I giggled in awe. And that's what I'm going to put on my tombstone. Terry Gilliam, he giggled in awe. And, and that's still how I go through life, giggling in awe at the whole, <laughs> the whole extraordinary nonsense that goes on out there. And there's two ways. You can get very serious about it, or you can sit in the back of the class. And I've been sitting in the back of cl the class of life all my life, giggling, uh, 
Michael Palin and I used to divide the world into the gigglers and the non-gigglers. There are those who sit up front and do their work, and there are those who sit in the back and giggle. And we were those. Python, what was Python about? Python, the nice thing about Python, and which was very rare, was that we were going out on British television with, yeah, I, I don't know, 10 million people watching us on a night, doing exactly what we wanted to do. Again, staying true to my rules of life. We were in a situation where we had all... The others had actually had, had moved straight out of college into television. They were very lucky. It was an interesting, interesting time because everything was changing very quickly. Um, young people were in the majority. Uh, the old people who were trying to make money knew this is a good market, so let's... let's uh, Let's humor these young people. And uh, out of Cambridge and Oxford came Beyond the Fringe, which was quite successful. And along with that came David Frost. And David Frost is a great entrepreneur, got into television, and had the intelligence to hire all of his friends from Oxford and Cambridge at that time to write funny lines for him. He took the credit for it. They did the work. Uh, but what it did do was allow people to come straight out of college and move right into working in television. And by the time we got around to doing Python, everybody had been doing it for, I don't know, six, seven years. And we're quite, quite experienced by then. And we went to the BBC, and John Cleese had become quite famous at this point. He had been working on the Frost Report with Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett. And the BBC had a standing invitation for John to come and make a television show whenever he wanted. And John wrote with Graham Chapman. And so there was a pair. And Mike Palin, Terry Jones, Eric Idle had been working on the Frost shows, on Marty Feldman's shows, writing, and had been doing a, a, a kid's show called Do Not Adjust Your Set. The great thing about kid's shows on television in those days was that nobody paid any attention to them. Uh, the people in power didn't pay attention to them. The people who decided what was right and what was wrong didn't pay attention. So they got away with murder. Uh, and they were doing stuff that we continue to do on Python. Um, but, we, but we're doing it earlier for children, um, or pretended to do it for children. They were doing it for themselves, as usual. And, and I, I got involved in this thing, and I started doing animation um, I'd never done animation before, and I was on a show that Eric Idle was on. It's called We Have Ways of Making You Laugh. And I used to sit there and draw caricatures of the, um, the guests as they would come on. And the camera would come over my shoulder and go into the, the drawing I was doing and then mix through to the, the real person. And they had some material that they didn't know how to present. And I said, let me make an animated film of it. And they assumed I knew how to make an animated film. And I assumed they knew I didn't. <laughs> Anyway, they gave me, I think it was 400 quid, two weeks to do an animated film, which I did, and it went out on television. And because I only had a very limited amount of money and, very, and more important, a limited amount of time, I had to find a way of faking it. Because regular animation is very time consuming. You've got to draw each frame, and there's um, basically there's 12 frames per second. There's 24 frames per second on film, and you do two frames at a time on animation. So that's a lot of drawings, and I didn't have the time, so I started cutting out pictures and moving things around in a very crude and simple way. And, and it went out on television. People hadn't seen that kind of work before, especially on television. And overnight, I became known as an animator. And so I was stuck in that one for a while. And, and I was working with Mike and Terry and Eric on Do Not Just Your Set, and, and the four of us at the end of that series, decided we wanted to do something else, got together with John and Graham, took advantage of John's invitation at the BBC, and came up with a show called Monty Python's Flying Circus, which the BBC were totally confused about and did their best.